Now, we're in Revelation, and I felt strongly to be in this book, this great book of Revelation. And we're going to be talking about the rapture of the church. Now, I've received messages and uh, different words from people outside of our congregation, don't even know who they are, who disagree with me, who thinks I'm being deceptive in what I'm preaching. But I want to just encourage you that I'm not moved by that because I will declare what he has laid upon my heart so that when I stand before him, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. So I hope you receive this morning. It's not doom and gloom. It's a time to rejoice because Jesus is coming back. And this morning, I pray for our president. I pray for our leaders of this great nation of America, that God would grant them wisdom and direction to be able to not only protect our country, but lead our country in the path that would help us light the lamp of the gospel and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Luke 21 this morning, verse uh, 36. Look with me. Luke 21, verse 36. In fact, look at verse 34. I want to start there. Jesus said, be on guard. Now, he's talking in context referring to the last days. He says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that the day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. When Jesus returns, it will be suddenly, in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, just as fast as you can blink. That's how quickly he's going to return. And everything will begin to unfold as the day of the Lord. It will happen. Verse 35. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's going to affect the world. Sort of how this pandemic has affected the world. The return of Christ will affect the world. Look at verse 36. But keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength and be accounted worthy to, go ahead and highlight it, escape. That's right. You preaching escapism? Absolutely. Ha, it's what Jesus declared to me and to you. It's written in red in your Bible. Be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So he's saying, watch, pray. Do not allow the cares and worries of life to weigh you down. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4. As you have studied with me, we, of course, started in chapter 1. John the Revelator vanquished to the Isle of Patmos. He's there to die by the Roman government, a martyr's death for his faith in Christ. Perhaps he was the bishop of the seven churches of Asia Minor, of which he writes to in chapters 2 and 3. We covered the last two churches last week, the Church of Philadelphia, which represents the mission church, the church that is in revival and the world, America, saw this revival with men like John Wesley and, uh, in, in the early uh, 17th century and 18th century. John Wesley coming on the scene, declaring the gospel, blazing the trail for evangelism, the rise of the Methodist church, the Wesleyan church. Then, of course, the Presbyterian church followed suit. Then, of course, the great Pentecostal revival of the late 19th, early 20th century on into today, sweeping across America, sweeping across the world, to now, today, Pentecostalism is the largest sect of Protestantism in America. Think about that. Because God has raised up a church. He's raised up a people who are carrying the lamp of the gospel in the fullness of and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, go with me. Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we covered the Laodicean church of chapter 3. Uh, Laodicean, the, the word Laodicea actually means people's rights or the rights of people. Jesus was telling us that in the last days, people would be more concerned about their rights than they would about the coming of the Lord. Well, I have the right to do this. I have the right to do that. I have the right to be who I want to be, do what I want to do, when I want to do it. 
And that mindset is creeping into the church, into the body of Christ, unfortunately. But you don't have to be part of that. Listen, you can be watching, waiting, looking for the return of Jesus Christ. But he said the Laodicean church was lukewarm. And he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. There's so many people sitting on church pews who think they are saved. But they've never experienced true salvation. But the good gospel news is, is that you can experience it today. You can experience the power of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God that will transform your life. You can. Revelation chapter 4, that brings us to the things that will be hereafter. Now, John in chapter 1 verse 19, in fact, I'll read it to you. 1 verse 19, he says, Therefore write the things which you have seen, which was the revelation of Christ, the things which are, which are the seven churches that he writes to, and the things which will take place after these things. So chapter 1 is the revelation of Christ. Chapters 2 and 3, the church age. That's where we're living right now. And then chapter 4 and 5, something miraculous takes place. And then chapter 6, we see the beginning of the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, that time of Jacob's trouble. But in chapter 4 and verse 1, after these things I looked, John declared, and behold a door standing open in heaven. <laughs> Not the Isle of Patmos, in heaven. Now I want you to see the symbolism, the picture that is painted here in Revelation chapter 4. We saw in chapter 3 in the latter part that Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open that door, I will dine with him and he will dine with me. What does that tell us? That faith is what opens the door to allow Christ into our lives. And I pray that you would make that decision to open the door by faith and allow Christ to abide on the inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, he says, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet. So two important key words here, door and trumpet. When we think about Noah, God told Noah to build an ark. Why? So that he could lift the righteous above the judgment that was coming upon the earth. Christ is our ark of safety. When Noah entered into the ark, the Bible says that God shut the door. Not Noah. God shut the door behind him and lifted them above the judgment that came upon this blue marble planet. And that's what he'll do for the body of Christ. That's what he'll do for his bride. Christ is our ark of protection, our ark of safety, our ark of salvation. And when the rapture, when the snatching away of the saints of God takes place, he's the one that will shut the door when we are in heaven. Just like John. He said, the voice I heard was like a trumpet. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 16 through 18, when Paul declares, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's the key phrase in that verse. In fact, caught up in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 tell us that in the Greek harpazo, the root Latin word of that word is raptura, which is where we get our English word rapture from. We are raptured, caught up instantly, suddenly. We are snatched from this planet. The rapture, the escape that Jesus talked about, that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. The rapture. The sudden snatching away. The, the voice like a trumpet. Now, let's continue to read in Revelation 4 and verse number 1. He said, I heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me. And he said, notice what he says. Come up here. And that's exact. Now, in the Greek, that's an instantaneous 
translation. In other words, he was instantly called up into the third heaven where God is. And John actually witnessed. He saw you and I in heaven. Oh, around the throne of God. As we continue to read, you will see that. He saw the beauty and splendor of the glory of God in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come up here. We see a picture of the sudden snatching away and the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I will show you what must take place. Underline this. After these things. What things is he referring to? He's referring to chapters 2 and 3, the church age. He's showing John what is taking place after the time of the Gentiles, the time that we live in right now, the church age, the dispensation of grace. Once this dispensation is concluded, Christ will rapture the body, the church will be called up just as John was called up. The voice, the sound of a trumpet. He'll shut the door as he shut the door at Noah's ark and lifted them above the judgment that would come upon the world. That's what he's going to do for us if you place faith in Jesus Christ. If you put your trust in the finished work of our risen Savior, I believe he will transform you and change you. And I believe he'll do it in the name of Jesus. Now, Verse 2, immediately, there it is again, <laughs> suddenly, the return of Christ, the rapture, it will be an immediate, sudden thing. I was in the Spirit, and behold, he sees a throne that was standing in heaven. Hold your marker right there. I want to read Psalm 103, verse 19 to you. When we think about the throne of God, I want you to understand that he is actually in the third heaven here. He's where God is. There are three heavens, pastor. Oh, yes. Paul said, I was called up into the third heaven. That's where God is. And he saw things he could not discuss. I believe he couldn't discuss it because God had a plan for John to talk about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Psalm 103, look with me, uh, and you can reference this verse here. Psalm 103 and verse 19. And it says these words, The Lord has established his throne... In heaven, in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. His sovereignty, his providence, his plan is ruling at all times. That's why I encourage you, don't allow what's happening in the world today to shift you or move you from your foundation of Jesus Christ in faith in the Lord, because God, the Father, is still on the throne. <laughs> and He's still in control. His sovereignty is ruling over all. And His plan will be fulfilled. His plan will play out above any plan that man may have, whether it be presidents or world leaders or whoever can conjure up a plan to try to deceive people. God's plan will always override their plan. You can rest assured. So despite how you feel about what we're facing today with COVID-19, I've heard so many different things. Well, it's a conspiracy. It's not real. It's not the... Listen, it doesn't matter because his plan will override their plan any day of the week. He's in control and he's still on the throne and he is who I trust. I put my faith in the Son of God, the one who is at the right hand of the throne of God in the third heaven. Let's continue to read. He begins to describe what he sees. So he sees a throne standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne. Who is that? That's the Ancient of Days. That's God the Father. And verse 3, now, many people picture the Trinity as God the Father with a white beard sitting on a throne and Jesus sitting beside of him. Could not be further from the truth. In fact, God, the image of the invisible God, is Jesus. Colossians 1.15. He's the bodily picture of of God the Father. He's God in the flesh. He says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But John begins to describe what he sees. When you think about God the Father, think about his glory. Because that's who he is. 
It's not what he manifests. He is glory. In fact, Paul says it's an inapproachable light. Oh, think about that. The light of the world. You can't even approach it. And that's what John describes to us. His glory is his presence. Hallelujah. The glory of God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. No man hath seen God at any time, the Scripture declares to us. But Abraham ate with him. <laughs> Moses saw his hinder parts, the glory that passed by him. But nobody ever saw him in the fullness of his glory because they could not see it and live. But John got to witness something powerful. Go with me. Verse 3, and he who was sitting was like a jasper. <laughs> now, jasper is something that you could see through, almost a clear substance. But it represents purity, the purity of the glory of God, the purity of God the Father. He said, I saw what looked to be jasper, a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. Sardius is a red color. Crimson, more uh, representing the, the judgment of God. And that's what he's doing. He's sitting as the judge of the whole world on his throne, dictating what is happening in the last days. He's in control. That's what that speaks to us, Sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. Once again, we see types and shadows and pictures. Where else did you see a rainbow? In the days of Noah. His covenant with Noah. That he would never flood the earth with water again. Now I know that, uh, that there is a, a group out there that has taken the rainbow and made it a symbol of their debauchery and outright sin and unrighteousness. But I want to remind you, it doesn't matter what they do with the rainbow. The rainbow will always be a sign and a covenant from God and his promise to his people. And that's what John the Revelator is seeing. That God has promised to take his people out of the earth just as he took Noah. Out of the judgment that was coming upon the world. God is going to take his bride. And we're going to be around the throne of God John has already seen this happen, and we have a covenant, and the rainbow speaks of the covenant. Around the throne, like an emerald in appearance, emerald being a green which represents grace and mercy. During the tribulation period, not only is he judging the world, bringing judgment as a just God, judging Israel, seeing if they will repent. Not only is he pouring out his wrath, but he's also showing mercy and grace. Because during the whole time, he's giving the world an opportunity to repent and call him Lord and Master. So when you read Revelation, don't just read it as the wrath of God being poured out. Read it as the greatest love story that could ever be told. Because God in His sovereignty, knowing who's going to turn their back on Him, gives them an opportunity to make a choice to accept Him or not. The love of God revealed in Revelation. Verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Chapter 5 reveals who these are. But most theologians, scholars believe that these are representing of the whole body of Christ, Old Testament, New Testament. Twelve tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, 12 plus 12 equals 24. Uh, the 12 tribes represented the people of God in the Old Covenant. The 12 disciples represent the, us, you and I, the people of the New Covenant. You put those together, you have a representation here. People clothed in white, crowns of gold. Only those who have been redeemed will be clothed in white and given a crown. Go with me. Uh, verse number 5. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So we see a picture of the tabernacle 
of Moses. In that tabernacle, the only light that they had was from the golden candelabra, the lampstand, that was given oil that produced fire that would light up the tabernacle was a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminating the revelation of God. And we have it here because the earthly tabernacle is a reflection and a picture of the heavenly tabernacle. There's a heavenly tabernacle. God is sitting on the throne, the mercy seat, the holy of holies, where the glory would come down on the day of atonement, when, when the glory of God was revealed in the tabernacle. But we see these golden lampstands, and he continues to, to declare, there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, we covered that in chapter 1. It's not seven individual spirits, but in Isaiah 11 and verse 2, it gives us a sevenfold fulfillment of the fullness of the Spirit. He is the Spirit of wisdom, counsel, and might. Uh, the Spirit who helps us gain knowledge and understanding. The Spirit of the fear of the Lord. You'll see seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit that fulfill this passage as the fullness of the Spirit. What's it telling us? That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-eternal, operating as one in your life and in the earth. So, in other words, Jesus... So, when you think about the Trinity, this will help you. God wills it. Jesus did it. And the Holy Spirit, He manifests it. That's right. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus saved us. The Holy Spirit manifested by convicting us and bringing us to Christ. When you're seeking healing for your body, God wills that you be healed. Jesus healed you at Calvary, and the Holy Spirit quickened your body and manifests what God wills and what Jesus did in your life. That's what He's doing. And that's what He's doing here around the throne of heaven. Uh, verse 6, and before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion. Now, the lion speaks of the gospel. These, these creatures, the four living creatures, representing the gospel, the good news of the redemption of Christ. The lion speaks of the lion of Judah, Math, the book of Matthew. The gospel of Matthew portrays Christ as the lion of Judah. All right, And the second creature was like a calf. The gospel of Mark presents Jesus as a servant. He came to be the greatest servant of all. All right, uh, And the third creature had a face like a man. When you read the gospel of Luke, he's referred to as the son of Man, Luke talks more about his humanity and his human experience than any other gospel, showing him to be 100% man. And then the fourth was like a flying eagle. And of course, John, the one who penned Revelation, the one who saw this revelation in his gospel, he said that he whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. So we see the picture of the four Gospels. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Now, they're just not saying it three times. In the Greek, it actually bears out, He is holy, more holy, even more holy is the Lord our God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne, that's you and I, and will worship Him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns. Oh, how beautiful this is. Will cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Ladies and gentlemen, when the rapture takes place, and I want to ask you a question. Are you rapture ready? I want to give you an invitation this morning. And I want you to accept. I want you to make the choice 
You say, do I have a choice? Yes. The scripture declares, choose this day whom you will serve. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I want to ask you this morning, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be transformed? Do you want to be part of the family of God that will leave this earth and be at the throne of heaven to lay your crown at his feet? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, today I make the decision to confess my sin and realize that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And with my heart today, I believe that Jesus lived for me, that Jesus died for me, that Jesus resurrected for me, and that Jesus is coming back for me. And with my mouth, I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord.